There's plenty of time to speak afterwards, I promise. Uh, welcome everyone to this uh, Venture Lab event. My name is uh, Niklas. And behind the microphone there and the camera is my colleague and friend Niklas as well. So we run Venture Lab. Uh, and we're an um, organization that tries to help students develop their ideas. And uh, one way we do that is through inspirational lectures. And that's why we have the online farm team with us here today. Um, we first had an idea that we wanted to be in garden, but since you know we're getting showers every five minutes, <laughs> it felt like it might be a bit troublesome with the equipment and everything. Uh, since the campus is still on semi shutdown, we are recording this so you can view it later. And uh, so if you missed something today or you didn't get it, you can always review it. And we put every lecture on Venture Labs YouTube. So be sure to check that out if you want to see what we've done in the past. Um, and just a friend, uh, friendly reminder so this Tuesday we have another lecture coming up. It's a very interesting topic, which I hope even you guys might be interested in which is um, how we can produce um, animals in a more sustainable way. So it brings up um, how animal welfare can be a win-win for both the animals and for the farmer. And with us there, we have a researcher from Rice who has done a lot of work uh, on site with farmers and trying to improve the health, uh, health of the different animals. So I really encourage you to sign on to that as well for an interesting discussion. Uh, and you can, as you did with this one, uh, register on Eventbrite. Yes. Yes. No, no she's included. Yes. Oh, that, that thing. My, maybe something else than soup this time. We'll see. <laughs> it's soup weather. Uh, so um, let's get started. Welcome on our farm team. Um, so just to get things started, can you just tell us who you are and... Uh, I'm guessing you're part of the online farm team. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm Billy, and this is Billy, and uh, we're part of the a bigger team of students who started Arnold's Agroecology Farm. Uh, we're also uh, master students here in our second year studying agroecology. So, if you were to try to explain to someone who's never heard of the online farm team. Um, what would you say it is, and who's behind it? Well, it's, behind it is a, it's a group of very motivated students that have initiated this and are running it right now. And in its current state, it's a market garden that I mean, you guys can see or walk past. It's to that right behind you. It's 400 square meters of vegetable cultivation, uh, which we're selling to CSA. Yeah but it's also a bed of dreams uh, <laughs> where all things are possible. <laughs> so yeah, the future is full of, yeah, whatever new students and people mm. are going to bring to this project. So that's an important thing to emphasize that it's ever mm. evolving. So, so who's doing our lab farm team now? Who is involved? Yeah. So. <laughs> it is us too. Yeah. And then we have a couple more people in the core team that are running the organization. Uh, a lot of the administrative stuff and time in the work. And then we have a, yeah, another dedicated team of friends, students, volunteers that are coming in. Especially now, a bunch of you guys have already been uh, and you know, checked out the farm, either through a farm visit with a new program. Um, they all come as a volunteer and help us uh, do some tasks. Mm -hmm. the farm. So the project is open to everybody, every student at USU who is mm -hmm. interested participating yeah. and becoming a member and getting yeah, some practical yeah. experience. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Um, I'm hearing a lot of exciting stuff. So I'm just going to try, try to unpack it a <laughs> bit. Uh, so you say you are a group of motivated students. I'm hearing agroecology. Um, I'm thinking, how did it all start? Did you just one day, okay, let's plant some seeds. Uh, can you tell us a bit about how you got started and why why you felt like this was something that you wanted to do? Yeah, um, well, I guess it started about a year ago. Um, we were in our classroom uh, and our teacher uh, at the time was really keen uh, that there exists somewhere on campus uh, an actual farm where students can have some practical 
uh, skills, learning, alongside their courses. Because, of course, it's very theoretical when you're at university, learning about sustainability, learning about production, um, and it's really hard to apply those things yourself to reality. Um, and yeah, we really felt this, that we were all practical people, like we wanted to do something. Um, the pandemic really emphasized that feeling, I think. So that maybe played in our favor to just be even more driven to start something. And so from then, there was like a whole process where we got together as a class, a slightly bigger group, had some ideas, like what could a farm be? What kind of agroecological elements would be realistic to have? Um, and then, yeah, we, then we went to pitch to the university for a place, piece of land, um, some funding to start up. And then it was in April this year that you guys, Venture Lab, approached us and offered to start on this garden here. Um, and it was really great that you did because it allowed us to have this start. Um, and of course, we were supported with tools um, and some indoor space to just get things going. And so although it was a very late start to the season, we were able to start at the beginning of May this year. Um, since then, everything's been growing and that's where we're at now, basically. <laughs> yeah. Do you have anything to fill in? Well, I guess I can re-emphasize that we've, we've had this, we felt this urge that, you know, I mean, this is an agricultural university and, you know, theory and practice are intertwined, but in university, you're, you're, you're only taught the theory also. Mm. And uh, we, we want to give students the opportunity to do something practical. Um, and that's, I think that really is the, where this germinated, mm. where this started mm. this project. Absolutely, yeah. So, so I'm, I mean, your students as well, right? So how much would you say that this is for, for you as students to be able to do what you want to do as a practical means? And how much would you say it's for everyone? Because when you're speaking, it sounds like you have a very altruistic approach to this. This is for all students. We just want to help them. But I'm guessing that you must have had some motivation to start it up yourselves, I'm yeah. guessing. I mean, absolutely, like we're including ourselves in mm. these students who were lacking practice. Mm. And so, I mean, what we've learned in the last year of thinking about this and doing it is insane. I don't, we haven't even sat down and really thought about all the things we've learned because it's huge. And so, of course, we've, we've benefited from being a part of this mm. experience. And it will continue to be like that for anyone mm. who gets mm. involved because it's not just about growing vegetables, uh, it's not just about putting a seed in the ground. It's also thinking, like we're going to talk about today, about having customers, mm. having a budget, mm -hmm. having to make income, managing people's schedules. Uh, there's everything behind it. Like it's a whole ecosystem of, of things going on. So mm. there's mm. a lot to learn. Yeah, it's mainly the learning experience right now. None of us is you know, having any monetary consideration out of this. You know, it wouldn't be possible on this scale. We're just trying to grow the project. and. Yeah, provide more students, more people here on campus with the opportunity uh, to do this stuff and have this learning curve. Mm. Mm. So if you were to think about who you're doing it for, you would say that it's at the moment mainly for students and I'm guessing also maybe for the customers that you're delivering to? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we also have this arm up wide vision of wanting to create an even stronger community here. Mm. You know, like, um, it's amazing that students can come and buy fresh vegetables on campus where they're living and studying. Mm. That's really, we have this sort of overall vision as well. And that there are people from the local community, from Loma, coming in, meeting students, talking about, you know, what we're learning about. And for them, that's, you know, really cool as well to have that interaction. And I mean, I personally, and I think Philip would agree, it's very beneficial to have these conversations with the public about how we're managing this project and the type of production. Uh, there's, yeah, a lot that people want to know about. Uh, like, for example, what, what are you getting? People want to learn about these sort of alternate, uh, like organic methods for production. We get a lot of questions yeah. about. Um, especially for the construction side of there, and our project is even more visible. Like, we've had people passing by where we set it up. My, my favorite interaction is this woman who came by, just saw us, you know, pulled over. Uh, and then started talking to us, you know, oh, I saw you using wood chips, you know, blah, mm -hmm. I have some very sandy soil, I have fungi growing in my garden, is this bad? 
and you know we ended up talking for half an hour. Then I told her about our upcoming CSA, yeah. and a month later she just signed up, and now she comes every Monday and picks up her picks up her box. So it's really, mm. I mean, it's really wholesome interactions we have with the people that are coming here, and that includes students mm. that drop by, but also the, the the wider community. And from my understanding, that's within the the campus development goals as well. And we're having talks to the campus development team at the moment. And they want to offer more opportunities you know, for, mm. for outsiders, for the, for the wider public, mm. to you know, experience and enjoy that, yeah. Mm. Learn from what SLU is doing, uh, but also provide more opportunities for students mm. to be trying to do a bit of both. Are you thinking that the location, I'm thinking that she just drove past, and if you're starting like a cafe business, location is everything. How much do you think that the location here has maybe helped or not helped you? I mean, so many ways that it has helped. I mean, of course, it's very central on the campus. So for people who are studying and working here, you know, people walking past the mm. whole time. Uh, this road right beside us connects directly to the work. Mm. So people who are out on a walk with their dog or uh, on a cycle ride, they see the farm. Uh, we're opposite a preschool, and so there are lots of families who notice us. And actually, there's one family who's a member of our CSA as well. Um, so yeah, location has been everything yeah. in starting this project, for sure. I mean, we could easily have been on a small piece of land outside of the campus, mm. and that would have been very difficult to have so much passing mm. interest. Yeah. Interesting. Um, talking about produce, we can see that there's a lot growing, and of course, if you haven't already been to the farm, I uh, really encourage you to take a walk after this. Um, so. What are you producing and why are you producing that? We're producing a lot of different things. We always say it's between 20 and 30 vegetables and herbs, depending on how many herbs you want to plant as an actual you know, production and not mm. just for fun. Um, so it's, it's a lot of leafy greens this year, which you know, is because you can produce a lot of produce on little space and it's very possible to produce even when you start um, Late in the season, as we mm, do. Mm. So there's a bunch of brassicas, and you know, there's, there's kale, and now we have China cabbage or maple cabbage in as well. Um, some root vegetables like carrots, sweet radishes, turnips, beets, this kind of stuff. And a few fruit vegetables as well, like zucchinis, um, and now we might have some broccoli coming up. Mm. So it's, yeah, it's a bit of everything. Like that's, I guess, what we might get it into later the CSA. We try to provide people with just like a, a diverse and somewhat balanced. Uh, Vegetable offering mm. every week. And that's. Do you have anything to add there, Lily? Uh, beans. <laughs> beans. <laughs> magical fruit. We could <laughs> list all of them. It's, yeah. it's a lot more. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. yeah, I encourage you to just pop by and check it yeah, out. Yeah. See what's growing. Because we have some mm. interesting cultivars as well. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's also nice that we're looking to surprise people with uh, different varieties that they might not have seen before. Mm. Uh, these multicolored carrots and things that we want to offer something different as well to what's out there in Ikea. And yeah. that's not hard because there's a lot more out there than what's yeah, in the supermarket. Yeah, yeah. So we really want to educate mm. people about that as well. So I'm thinking last, last, um, last time we had Nordfra here, uh, the, the Swedish producer of seeds, um, and they talked about you know sustainability a lot and choosing the right seeds and everything. Um, how do you approach that when it comes to maybe selecting between different seed, ma seed manufacturers, maybe F ones, organic, uh, the cultural heritage, those types of questions? Is this something you thought about? <laughs> seed saving, etc. Yeah, that's a deep cut right there. Um, <laughs> I'd say I mean, we buy all our. From organic, from organic producers. So mm. a bunch of them comes from Germany, which is a company that is focusing on, um, yeah, non-hybrids. Mm. So one of their goals is that people will produce their own seeds. You know, and that's just not monopoly uh, on the cultivars they provide. So we are definitely mindful of that. We have a couple of hybrids we grow this year. Like we try in different zucchinis and figure mm. out oh, this hybrid actually is much more reliable than the the open pollinated one. Mm. Um, yeah. But I say in general, we try and look for stuff that we, we do like the open pollinated ones. And yeah. we are trying to save some seeds. Actually, from my understanding, many of the flower seeds that you know that have gone to flower now and produce seeds, and we're going to have some at the library for, for people to pick up, right? 
Yeah, so mm. I mean, that's a, a side uh, project, but mm. the library here is starting a seed library um, that so students can exchange seeds. And yeah, we're going to contribute some things yeah. to that at the end mm. of the season. But yeah, um, it's true that this year, because we had this limited space, mm. we didn't get to go full in with uh, the, all the diversity that mm. we could, but that's definitely space to develop in the future like looking mm. more into swedish seeds uh, we have nord gen right here mm. like opposite us the potential collaborations that could be there and nord as well mm. that mm. we spoke to last week um and so that's definitely something that can be a focus in the future mm. more interesting yeah and you have a limited amount of space for sure um is there something that's on your wish list that you really wanted to produce that you couldn't? I'm guessing there might be a few things. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think, I guess I speak for all of us, or every grower that you, you know, if you could, you would grow so many more things, mm. but it's just not, not managing. Mm. Uh, I guess all of us really want to grow some you know, squash, like winter squash, pumpkins and stuff like that, mm. which needs a lot of space. So mm. that, that didn't make any sense last year. And also some, some fruit vegetables, like, you know, uh, broccoli is super popular, but mm. hard to grow a small space. Mm. Mm. Um, so that's a lot more. And in the future, we're looking into you know, getting a bit bigger land base and also mm. looking at perennial crops that we could grow, you know, you know shrubs and trees like perennial you know, herbs and yeah, sprouts, mm. stuff like that. There's a lot more coming for sure. Yeah, exciting. Do you have any favorites that you felt like you were missing? I mean, always more mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good we, this, I mean, this year was just an experiment to try and do some. Uh, log inoculation and also some directly on the bed inoculation of mushrooms. Um, like we we know very little about growing mushrooms, so we're sure. experimenting. And I mean, we would really like in the future to have more of this, uh, and like more knowledge coming in about it. Experimenting with even more ways to grow uh, different varieties. Again, like introducing customers and people to to mushrooms that you're not finding. Uh, commonly in, in the market, um, and so that would be something that, yeah, personally, <laughs> feel like it would be nice to. But did you did you get mushrooms this year? Well, we actually have our first one that came up this morning. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so you're going to split it. that twenty six times. <laughs> I'm guessing between yeah, your exactly. shares. Yeah, exactly. It's yes. about this big, yes. but it's definitely yes. uh, this yeti card that we mm. inoculated on a kale bed. Um, and we chose this mushroom because, I mean, apparently there's potential for it to form a good symbiosis with Brassica uh, family. And so we just wanted to try it out. Uh, we inoculated it in the middle of the dry summer, so the worst mm -hmm. time. Uh, but now that there's been some decent rain, it's actually managed to fruit one mushroom. So mm -hmm. we'll see. I mean, yesterday we were with some volunteers and we did some more inoculation. But we're very much... Uh, Amateurs at this. <laughs> yeah, as you said, I mean, it's not enough for Seas Asia, and it's just mm. at an experimental stage yeah. at this point. And we're trying to figure it out, and maybe we can mm. scale it in the future yeah. so everybody can eat some more. Well, I'm guessing that's part of the concept. If you're doing this to for the students and you're part of that team, of course, I'm guessing you might want to experiment and that it can't just all be down to business. Mm. Exactly. And that's... how do you manage that? It's a good question. Yeah, this year, this year we had to just say, now we have 400 square meters, we need to grow enough produce to provide mm. people with, with food. And so we kind of went for proven concepts, you know, mm. went for market gardening, went for cultures I knew or people mm. knew and that we needed mm. to produce a decent crop. So I guess experimental is really around the corner once we have, uh, once we have a bigger land base. Like we're thinking what happens to kind of food forest uh, where you can just try out a lot of different things, you know, both perennial, uh, both uh, shrubs, trees and herbs. Yeah. Uh, so, there will be lots of opportunities to do more experimental things in the future. Like yesterday, we had this, uh, yeah, a, a Chinese uh, student that came by and she said she wanted to, to order some Chinese chives seeds from China and uh, we should grow that next year. So, yeah, I think it's, that's definitely what's going to be interesting in the future of this kind of a project is that there's got to be space for learning and therefore experimenting and mistakes. But it also has to survive as a business, so it has to be able to reinvest on itself. You have to be able to afford next year's seeds and compost. And so it's always going to be 
treading this line between, okay, like we want to try new stuff, but we also have to make it work. So that's really going to be the learning curve. Um, that I mean, I think we think that's really important is always being connected to reality and like, where can this go? Is this going to contribute to the mm. business? Um, but then also remaining fun and open to different things. That's uh, the, I think the key learning from yeah. this. So that brings us sort of to sales. Um, yes. What is a CSA? I'm, I'm sure there are some that aren't familiar with it. What does it stand for and what does it mean? CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture, which is a scheme that we've been running or we've been selling most of produce through, which uh, in principle means that people buy, yeah, we usually say a share of the harvest, but what it entails is that they get a weekly delivery of the produce um, for, for the whole season and they pay up front. So in the beginning of the season, they, they will pay a certain amount and then they come every Monday now and up their vegetable delivery based on availability. So we pick whatever we have, what's ready for them, and make a nice box that kind of represents the value of what they pay for it for the mm. weekly basis. Mm. And I think what's interesting about it um, is this thing that you're paying at the beginning of the season. Because um, of course you could do a system where people pay week by week for boxes. But this trust that's involved in this like okay you commit to a contract of uh, however many weeks, for us it was 14 weeks, but a full season could be 30 weeks, where you're just going to roll with the punches of what's happening on the farm. Because, of course, we don't know what pests are going to attack our crops. We don't know what kind of disasters. There may be a whole family of rabbits that just get in one night and eat everything. And so as the consumer in a CSA, you're signing up to the risks, but also the benefits of sharing. So when we have excess stuff, that goes to our CSA customers because it's an up and down roller coaster. Yeah. You know, sometimes something goes off the menu because it's been mm. damaged by a pest. And as a customer, you're you're signing into that system, which I think is a really healthy way to see your food source. It's not just going to have the same shaped zucchini on your shelf every mm. single week. Sometimes <laughs> the zucchini won't be there. And so it's definitely educational as a as a customer first. Mm. So you've listed some of the pros and cons there, I think, very good. Um, the risks and the potential benefits. Uh, but I'm guessing most people aren't very accustomed to that. Uh, have you got any backlash at all from that system? I mean, not face to face. Uh, <laughs> Just angry are, emails. And... No, people are so happy. Like, yeah. It's mainly positive feedback. But I mm. mean, we are really interested in talking more with the customer at the end of the season. Like mm. what was not so good, uh, what would you have had differently? Mm. Um, we have a little feeling that people got a bit sick of beetroots at some point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was a lot of mm. beetroots. Um, and so, yeah, this, these little tweaks. But that's also the point is that we're in direct contact. Yeah. They're here every single week. And so we can ask them straight away, like, how is this? Mm. Do you enjoy it? What can we change? So, yeah, it's all about communication. So from the get-go, we said, you know, this is what you sign up for, and we're going to provide vegetables. And they are clear that maybe it will change their diet. They, mm. they will probably not buy kale every week, but, you know, we have a lot of kale, so they get mm. kale every week. Um, but so far, I think we've got more like a resounding positive feedback because people, mm. the people that sign up are usually interested in this kind of stuff, and they're willing mm. to, you know, change their diet and try new things. So they often come back and they're like, oh, I tried this recipe, and it's been super nice. And mm. Like, yeah. oh, I started really enjoying kale, or, you know, I feel mm. this and that. Mm. So I think it's mainly positive. It's mm -hmm. mainly positive. And maybe it doesn't some things don't work out for certain people, but that's just you know the risk you might be signing up for. Mm -hmm. Are you helping the customers with like recipes and uh, stuff like that? So I know some CSAs do. Uh, they have a weekly newsletter. This is what you're getting in your box. How do you communicate and do you try to encourage them to use the produce in a certain way? Yeah, so this is um, sort of a topical question. Um, so we do send uh, an email out at the start of every week of what's going to be in the box and then bits of other news of what's happened in the last week or if there's an upcoming event or, like, for example, this week we had to clear all the basil because it's getting to the end of the season, the temperatures are getting too low. And so we wrote to everyone, like, OK, you have to make pesto this week. There's so much basil. And so... We do prepare them a little bit. Mm. 
definitely in the future, it would be super nice to have this regular recipe system. Like I was a member mm. of the CSA elsewhere before, and they were really established. And every week, the box came with recipe ideas, and that was really awesome. But of course, it takes a lot of organization. Mm. Um, and it, that's definitely something to develop for the future. Uh, but I mean, even amongst themselves, the CSA customers sharing ideas. They are. You know? And we mm. encourage them to do that. Lots of people haven't consumed chard before, Swiss chard, um, where some people really love it. Mm. Um, and so we have this one lady in particular who's like telling everyone like how they should use the chard in their weekly cooking. And, and how are, when they're meeting, when they're doing the sort of the pickups, yeah. is that where that conversation takes place? Exactly. Yeah. So people tend mm. to hang around okay. as mm. well. I mean, of course, some people are sometimes rushing. Mm. Uh, life is like that. Yeah. But I think people really try and make time to hang out because they enjoy it. It's a really mm. nice mm. interaction. Um, and, yeah. yeah, I agree. I mean, like, I'd say that's our favorite part of the whole mm. experience. Uh, it's very fun to just meet people, vegetables, and see them mm. and develop and exchange ideas. Yeah. That's, I think that's happening on a regular basis. And, yeah, of course, in the future, we. That's always the goal. I think every CSA, everything I've been involved in, we set out very ambitiously and say, mm. yeah, we're going to provide recipes every week, but yeah. no, that's not the highest priority. We keep mm. doing, you know, we have a lot of other tasks we yeah. have to do. Um, so this, thus far, it hasn't happened. But, no. you know, it's definitely a goal. If there's any chefs out there who are <laughs> willing to design like a 30-week mm. recipe cycle, you're welcome. <laughs> really, it's, it's like week by week, I guess, but, uh, yeah. depending on availability. We actually had a member mm. who shared a bunch of recipes or his yeah. wife shared a bunch of recipes because um, she runs a cafe, yeah. so mm. Mm. she has some recipes to share. So that's great. Kind of mm. the most yeah. recipe sharing that's yeah. happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah we could think about making a group with all the members and just mm. have them share stuff. But that also needs to be maintained. So you need to see where you mm. have the capacities right now. Since yeah. we're student run, we are. I mean, we are. It's a lot of free. A lot of our time that goes into this mm. right mm. now. We figure that this is, you know, something that will come at a later point when yeah. we have the capacity for it. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. And how did you market your shares? How did you get the customers? So when we were starting up uh, in April, mm. we knew that it was going to happen and there was going to be some vegetables. Uh, we were sending surveys around the university to begin with, like uh, what would people be willing to pay? What kind of vegetables do they like? Mm. Uh, what would be uh, the best pickup scenario? So we kind of did this groundwork. And we had loads of respondents. I mean, it was over 100 people who responded. And people left us messages like, I want to sign up. Like, please mm. tell me when. Mm. Um, and so then when we had established like a crop plan, also based on what people said their preferences were, um, we took yeah. as much as possible into mm. account. Um, we then sent out, again, within the university ecosystem uh, that we were running a CSA. And we also had our social media, so we posted there. Um, and then the people who walked past, like mm. Philip said, mm. there's this lady who lives in Loma who just signed up from mm. walking mm. past the farm. So in the end, we got a nice mixture of uh, local people mm. uh, from the community, from students, and then staff and researchers in mm. the university. So it's been a really nice mixture of, of people. I think we're very yeah. fortunate with our location here. Yeah. A lot of people around, a lot of people mm. interested in food, uh, people willing to commit to this. Um, so I think we sold out the, we, we said initially 20 shares, and that mm. was two days. Yeah. And then we had those uh, people that committed to that. Mm. And then we said, oh, okay, we're going to reopen it and try and mm. get some more mm. people. Mm. So now we're up to 26 shares, which is definitely maxing. Mm. Mm. So, how did you think about setting the prices for the boxes? So, I mean, at first, it was very important to make it accessible to students. And why was that important? Because we're students, projects <laughs> with students. Yeah. Um, and this is also like, it can be a lot of an issue for a student. Like, mm. you want to eat healthily and you want to care for the environment. You don't have your own space of land and you can't always go to the organic farmer's market. Uh, and so sometimes, like, you are forced to compromise on the quality of what you can buy. And we wanted to make this accessible to those people who usually have to compromise. Um, and I think we achieved that. Mm. But there were also other factors that went into the pricing. Yeah, 
I mean, I think it's quite decent pricing. You have you round about what you would pay for, I think, organic vegetables in the store, but definitely not more expensive than that. Um, and we could have definitely had a price hike and paid twenty five percent more or even more than that. But then we probably only have attracted researchers and uh, you know mm. people that are kind of well off, I guess, in the area. And as you said, that's not really our goal. We want to be inclusive, both when it comes to the, the work and the commitment to the farm, mm. but also when it comes to you know buying mm. our produce. Um, and I guess we were in a somewhat fortunate position to to offer that price mm. since we're not directly economically dependent on it, since we're not taking a salary at this mm. point. And we also took into the consideration the fact that because we have a short season, we mm. don't have the full variety of crops. Like we couldn't mm. include tomatoes; it was just too late in the season to start tomatoes, and that's usually like a mainstay of a summer vegetable box. So it's, it's a high value crop, and some of those we couldn't provide. So we opted to offer smaller boxes and cheaper boxes, and then we don't have to mm. put that much into one one box mm. and just are okay with less diversity. Mm. And do you have any students in the CSA today? Yeah, we do. Yeah. Uh, I think some of the 26, I think there are about 10 who are oh. students. Oh, that's great. So that's, for us, that's the best result, really. Yeah. yeah. That brings us to, you mentioned organic a couple of times here. Um, are you organic? No. So, of course, uh, like organic <laughs> certification takes three years, and this is our first year. Mm. Um, but we can say that all the growing methods are organic. Yeah. Well, legally, I think you're not allowed to say that since there's yeah, some constraints to that. Um, what we what we can say, I mean, what I've heard many times with other farmers that do something mm. like this, that they don't opt to, to get organic certified, mm. since often they follow guidelines like actually we do that are more strict than what the conventional mm. organic method would be. Mm. And they don't feel like they need the certification since mm. they have this direct customer contact. So mm. they're always talking to the people. They know how, what they're doing, how they're growing, mm. and they trust them. Yeah. So maybe it's And do you feel that from your customers as well? Do they question whether or not it's organic? Do you get into not that? No, no, no. Yeah. The topics you're discussing and what you're learning. So how do you approach sustainability when it comes to the farm that you are managing? Yeah, there's <laughs> lots of things we would like to improve. I mean, obviously, we're not there. No. Um, it's very difficult with the project, I guess, yeah. to set up. Um, closing the nutrient circles, closing, uh, yeah, getting back. Uh, yeah, pretty much, pretty much that very thing, also the water yeah. cycle and stuff. But when it comes to the nutrients, I mean, we're importing compost, you know, and using a lot of compost, we're using some organic fertilizers. Um, since, you know, mm. we started from scratch, we needed some materials to uh, provide mm. fertility mm. for the plants. Water is municipal, so we don't have the perfect circularity at yeah. this point. It will take a few years to develop, mm. but that's something that's within the development goals of this project. Yeah, and I mean, it is like this in our studies as well. The conclusion is always you can't just like start the perfect uh, closed mm. nutrient system in year one. Mm. Like it depends on the investments you have, the land that you have, and for sure on this space it wouldn't be wouldn't be possible. And we couldn't have a water collecting system well, no, in this yeah. space. I mean, we wouldn't. We would. Mm -hmm. We would be losing money to do that. Like, we yeah. would mm. take a considerable chunk out of the, mm -hmm. the vegetable space, um, and yeah. we couldn't use our own compost because we didn't have a previous year of composting behind us. Whereas next year we will. We'll have some of our own compost. So these things improve over the years, and yeah. depending on what you start to include on the farm as well. But still, I think we're quite all right. I mean, we're using a lot of local things, mm. like the straw we use for mulching is from the research station up here. Mm. And for irrigation, we, we, we decided to lay out a, a drip irrigation, which, you know, there's more plastics and stuff involved, but it ends up conserving huge amounts of water compared to an overhead irrigation system. So I think I'd say we're doing all right, but that's just... <laughs> yeah, and we're the kings and queens of uh, recycling. Mm. We're dumpster and geniuses, we've used everything that we've made has been with recycled materials. So yeah, from that point of view, like we've uh, emptied a lot of bins. <laughs> the whole farm is built on directly on the grass, so we haven't dug. So we've uh, covered the whole field with cardboard, which we recycled or dumpstered all over the campus and everywhere. It's a lot of ripping of stickers and, and you know metal stuff from cardboard. Inspiring. <laughs> it, it'll be exciting to see what happens in a few years, for sure. Um, 
I'm going to try to finish up with some questions here and then we can take questions from the audience. Um, it sounds like you're putting in a lot of work. Um, just out there, how much time would you say that you've put in so far and how much are you doing on a weekly basis in between everyone who's involved? How much work does it take? I mean, so of course to set it up mm. as well, that was like an insane amount of time because mm. we had this time pressure of getting the season going mm. and you saw us uh, shoveling dirt for a yeah. while. That was fun. Uh, yeah. So at that time we were, we were here like oh, 40 hours, 30 hours a week to set it up. Um, wow. And we're a group of four or five, sometimes six people. Um, whereas nowadays, like the focus is much more on like splitting tasks up, uh, having people a bit more responsible for one area, so we can reduce the time commitment for everyone. Mm. I mean, it's a bit different now because also Philip, Caroline, and I, mm. uh, through the people running the farm, are doing this uh, as an internship in our studies, which is an eighty percent commitment, and we are doing that now. Mm. We're an eighty percent time commitment, so. Yeah, I think I can add that you know, physically it was uh, a big commitment in the beginning when we had to set it up, build the infrastructure. Um, and that was definitely more than you know, a normal student should, should have to handle. Um, but now, from a physical perspective, like what we have to do there in place, it's not that much. Like oh. It can be amongst a few people, it can be done quite easily. Monday we have harvest day and then uh, right now we're doing uh, volunteering spots where students can come in and you know, join the project and have a look. And that takes a little bit of time, but it, it's not that it's not that hard to run for 100 square meters at this established stage. Um, but we're doing a lot of behind the scenes work. We're doing a lot of like communicating with whatever is going on, campus mm. development, or you know, there's there's a lot of parties, sort of stakeholders that mm. we're communicating mm. with and amongst themselves. So that takes a major time right now for us at least. Yeah, but I mean, the idea in the future is to have positions that people mm. are going to take within mm. the, the organization and uh, there's going to be specific roles that have mm. like a certain hourly commitment per week that's nothing insane. Mm. Like, the idea is to make mm. it work with everyone's schedules and their commitments. Yeah. But... And so is there someone in charge of organizing? Uh, I mean the volunteers that come or do, is this just something that you see from a day-to-day -day basis what needs to be done? Or do you think about that? Uh, we have a structure set up, so yeah. we have a volunteer schedule that people can sign up to. Um, we have an, a list of interested people that's based on the, the student groups that visited mm. um, our block. So there's probably a bunch more interested students mm. out there that we haven't reached yet. That mm. We mm. Uh, are probably going to reach, probably going to send out an email through the lineups, you know, mm. uh, this email thing. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how we organize the volunteer right yeah. now. There's five, sp five slots or five people can come for yeah. every volunteering slot. Doing one, no, we do right now. We have four a week that we offer Monday yeah. afternoon for mm. the house. You say house Wednesday in the morning and in the afternoon, and today in the afternoon once we're done here. Mm. We have some volunteer work. In. And how do you motivate them? How do you keep uh, people motivated? I mean, it might rain this entire afternoon. How do you keep those non paid students wanting to come here and, and do the work? I mean, I don't think. For now, at least, it's not a problem no. because people come on their own choice mm. and it's because they want to learn or they mm. want to use their body a bit outside. And so it's not like anyone's there against their will. So <laughs> I would say the motivation is really high. Yeah. Um, but Can you say that for everyone in the core team as well? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, the motivation yeah. is, is high. Of course, it's, yeah. there are times that are tricky and there are disappointments mm. and things that we would rather not have to with hmm. but like when you're so passionate about a project working the motivation stays high and there's really yeah. rewarding things like everything we were talking about with the CSA having these customers hmm. and a system that's working well like that is an amazing reward hmm. so yeah, I of mean, course it's up and down yeah <laughs> I guess the people that come I guess we expect them expect them that they have the same motivation as us initially right hmm. to learn something about growing crops and just you know, meeting some other people that have the same, a similar interest. Mm. Um, so, so far, I don't think we've had problem. problems mm. motivating anyone. And what we usually try to offer is that everybody can take you know, something home after they've mm. come and volunteered, like 
Right now we have a lot of herbs, we have a lot of kale. Mm. So everybody can grab some of that. Or after mm. the CSA harvest, there's always some leftovers. Yeah. Mm. That's a little extra motivation. So just quick, top three lessons you learned since April. Lily? Top three lessons. Uh, it's very easy to be ambitious and not so easy to execute all of those big ambitions <laughs> straight away. Yeah. It requires patience yeah. and planning. Okay, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it takes, the more people you are, the more time it takes to organize tasks, which is not mm. necessarily a bad thing, but something you have to keep in mind. Mm. It's something we want, obviously. But mm. it's, yeah, that is something I learned. Yeah. And um, <laughs> I, I can get things. back to you on that. You can think about it for a few yeah. ten minutes. Um, yeah. Didn't mean to put you on the spot. There. <laughs> um, so, looking at the future, um, how do you see it evolving? What are you excited about? I mean, we are most excited about having new people coming in. Yeah. Now and you know, seeing where this can grow because this is like the first step is you know, how many people are interested, want to commit in, in any capacity to mm. do this. And then we can look at okay, well what are we gonna where are we gonna take this project from this this pilot stage here, mm. right? So that's I guess the most exciting thing is then to plan a new plot and come up with new ideas and have everybody contribute and make everybody like a part of this. Mm. You know, everybody can contribute to the actual planning stage, which mm. is yeah. one of the most exciting stages. Exactly. And not just have this feeling of being a, a volunteer in this project that you're not like really a part of. Like the idea is that people can take like an ownership of like, okay, hey, wow, I really want to develop this idea and I'm mm. going to make a plan for it and work out how it's going to fit in with this, this farm and like really execute something and feel proud of themselves. Like that's important. It's this feeling of like real responsibility within it. Within a project. Exactly, and that's why one of the next steps will be to set up a non for profit for this project where you know everybody that is, I guess, the limitation is that you have to be an affiliate at SLU or an SLU student, and then you can just become a member. You come to the first meeting, pay your membership fee, which is probably going to be, I don't know, 100 crowns, not very much, and then you know we're all equals, everybody has equal stake in this non for profit. Exactly. Exciting. So you want to expand and start a nonprofit and grow more things. Yep. If we haven't made that clear. <laughs> <laughs> so the so final question for me here. Um, so do you have any tips or uh, things you would like to tell other students that are thinking about doing a project of their own, maybe developing their own idea? Mm. Are you talking about student projects or starting a no, CSA? I mean, just an idea. I mean, you had an idea. You developed that. Um, what would you tell yourself uh, uh, if you could go back? Okay. Huh? <laughs> um, hmm? <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Actually, it's, uh, that's an excellent point. Yeah, Since, be helped. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's, we would be completely mm. lost doing this completely on our own from we wouldn't, Nothing. Yeah, we wouldn't have started this if it wasn't, you know, for you guys right. in this very case. Because um, we've been wandering around, just, you know, asking different... It was very... I think in April we were at the stage where we just said, no, it's not happening. It's not happening. You know, there's just no support. People don't trust that this can work. You know, mm. student run. There's just not... No, there was no support, really, it felt like. Yeah. And then you guys came around and were like, oh, yeah, you know, try it. Go ahead. Mm. So, definitely. Don't mention that. that really yeah, <laughs> that's the correct is, answer. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> there, no, but there is great support on, on campus. Like, yeah. That's the good thing about mm. Swedish universities. So this university in particular, mm. um, they encourage entrepreneurship. They encourage you know you starting projects and trying stuff out. Mm. But yeah, definitely seek advice if mm. you have a, an idea. There's mm. so many considerations that come into it. Like we're constantly asking for advice. Hmm. Whether it's from you guys, uh, we've consulted some uh, like external places from Asda as well about starting a not-for-profit, mm -hmm. um, about bookkeeping and hmm. all these things. Uh, just keep on like reaching out for hmm. advice and support because no one expects you to know everything straight away, hmm. uh, and you can save a lot of time by learning from other people's. Uh, 
Yeah, and I guess also the angle how you how you talk. Right? So I have uh, my class for example. So I can yeah. go. My back is to you there. Yeah, yeah, go ahead if you need to go, for sure. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah. Great answers. Um, we uh, we are running till one, so um, if uh, we have any questions from the audience, uh, we'll be happy to take them now. Yep. With more more time for planning. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, growing won't happen in winter. Yeah, there's too little light here and it's too cold for anything to grow outdoors and we only have an outdoor space. So the, the CSA runs until the 1st of November, is that correct? Or first week of November? First of November, yeah. Um, and by then it will just be you now clearing the beds and, and whatnot. And then there will be summer work in, in October, no, probably maybe beginning of November. We'll, set, we'll put some garlic down um, for next season and we'll cover the beds. There will be some green manure seeded, but the physical tasks will be pretty much done by then. For this season, and then it will be all figuring out what are we going to do next season. Yeah, just being prepared as possible for yeah. the start of the growing season next year. So if you want to get your hands dirty this year, you, you, know, you have to. It's today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, stick around. <laughs> Excellent questions. Any anyone else? Yep. Go ahead. So we've tried uh, three different types this year, the shiitake mushroom, uh, oyster mushroom, and this wine cap mushroom, which is the Hartkogens, the <laughs> no one ever knows, but I say it anyway in Swedish just in yeah. case. Um, and it's this uh, beautiful burgundy red mushroom that's very popular in North America, um, and it's delicious, but it's not so well known here. Not known. It's not known. It's not Nobody known. knows it. Well, here into mushrooms. It's a uh, wine cap mushroom. And in Swedish? Yes, the calm squeezing. Yep, the calm squeezing. Yeah. Okay. No, I've never heard of it. <laughs> Did you have another question? Yeah, absolutely. And it's a uh, bang on the money because uh, it's uh, something that we really have to think about, of course. We want the, this farm to continue into the future um, and we want to make sure it's handed over in the right way. Um, and of course, we're going to be still involved in this project in, in some way um, and making sure that yeah, there is someone to like, commit to this and hopefully a big team of people. Um, we've got to write our master's thesis at some point this year. Next year. Um, so, of course, like the amount of time that we personally can put in will be reduced. But, I mean, I think we would have a really hard time just like dropping it um, if there wasn't a secure structure around it. So, the focus now is really like creating this secure handover. Yeah, that's one of the biggest challenges of this project is continuity since. People who are not here forever, no, no one really is. Um, one goal we have is to employ a production manager at some point that has you know, financial incentives and also a bit longer time perspective. But for now, it's, it's all dependent on if there's you know, more students, maybe from earlier years, not like second year master students, but any students that want to commit to this and you know, keep this going after us. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Any final questions, thoughts? No? Then thank you so much for coming and thank you very much. <laughs> William Philip from um, Online Farm Team, great to have you with us here. And uh, yeah, we see you every day. <laughs> uh, so, uh, just a quick reminder uh, remember to check out uh, VentureLabSLU.com uh, for all the upcoming events. We host one every week now and it's always free lunch. Usually it's here, uh, but sometimes we're in the uh, outside the library as well. A lot of fun stuff is coming up. And do you need, and if you're thinking like, I have an idea that I want to develop or just have a conversation, as we brought up today, just uh, contact us through VentureLabSLU.com. There's a form there, and we'll get back to you as soon as possible.
So it's very easy to book a meeting. It's all confidential and it's all free. Thank you again for coming. Thank you.